Okay, let's go ahead and get started with workshop number eight. So first thing before I get into it, uh, does anybody have a big question? Something you want to ask we, we should discuss right now? No, nope, everybody's good? Uh, you know, I, am, I, I just want to let people know I'm available and I'm happy to spend hours with you. Uh, I'll be here every day, you know, Sunday through Thursday, except next week I'm gone on Thursday, I'm sorry. But uh, I'm here from about 9.30 to 4.30, every, all those times. And if you need help after hours, let me know. I can, try to, I can try to find some time. I'm over at the Holiday Inn, only a few miles from here. So I'd be happy to meet as, if you need help more on that, that time. Okay, um, today we're going to be talking about validation. And I'm going to give you a hint right away. Most of the validation stuff you need is because you've been given the wrong requirements. And, or you've not been given the requirements, although it is a requirement. And I'm going to be talking to you how do you get this out. Because for your technical work, if you don't have the right requirements, you're building the wrong thing. And you know, you're going to be keep asking to do it over and over again. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of times you're going to be pushed because you only have so much money. And so they're going to say, well, just do it based on this. Okay? And the old rule is that you never have enough money to do it right the first time, but you always have money to do it over again. Right? And that just drives you nuts. So you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm going to try to show you different things that I've learned that you can do to try to help, help solve this problem. But before we get into that, what I, the last homework you had was on your um, product roadmaps. So uh, did people find that easy enough to do? Uh, do, you, do you need help with that? I'm, I'm really ha willing to help later on on that. You, li you like some help, some follow-up? Fine, we'll be happy to do that. Um, would anybody like to share what they learned from their product roadmap? Product roadmaps, product roadmaps. Okay, I'm going to have to call on one. Who hasn't what? Uh, oh, I didn't bring one. Okay, is there anybody here from the audio book say, Dodd? Okay, tell me about your product roadmap. What did you figure out? Okay, smart watch, okay. Then this pop up and then integrate with the metro, provide it in the metro, for example. Okay. In the working area, people can hear, listen to the content. Okay. So, we are expanding. Okay, good. Well, one of the things that's very interesting, because I worked with Tanin quite a bit yesterday on product roadmap things, and what we discovered was, uh, I actually did the Harry Potter thing on you, didn't I? Yes. Okay. So they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this, and we're going to launch this, and then we're going to launch this. And I said, okay. I, I took my Harry Potter pin, okay? This, this is a different, I'm better than Harry Potter. I have lots of wands, right? And I went, boom, right? Now remember, here's the deal with the Harry Potter thing is, you set your plan, everything is going to go perfect. Uh, but Harry Potter, I've got Harry Potter, man. I, I, I can do it. Uh, boom, right? So here's, here's what that means. That meant that they, their costs were exactly what they expected, and they had all the money they needed for it. It's, just, it's, it's magic, okay? It's magic. Uh, everything that they planned, you know, it's going to be dirt, done on these dates, it was exactly right, right? These guys are good. I mean, that's, that's great, right? Um, they, you know, they, everything they had to plan for the product launch, the marketing, all the stuff, all the venues, all the, all the trades came, you know, write articles, all of that went exactly right. Okay, now my, my spell only lasts until the day they launched. Okay, and then I said, okay, two years later, you're out of business. Well, we're wrong, right? And so, you know, I said, well, you know, the usual thing is, well, if everything went right, then nothing could go wrong. I said, no, 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 no. Everything you planned went right, but you went out of business. How could you possibly go out of business? And they said, well, we already have this arrangement, this arrangement. So I said, that's great, but what happens if enough, you don't get enough people to buy your product? 
And I said, oh, well, that'd be a problem. I said, wow, that's one of those things getting wrong. Or what happens if people don't like your product? Ooh, that's really going wrong, right? Or what if somebody else comes out in the market and they have a better product for, or they have a, it doesn't even have to be a better product, but more people buy it and they don't buy my product, right? These are things. So we, when we started to go through it, you know, we list everything. Well, what can we do different in the product roadmap? Options. This may be plan A, but we, may, we want to have a plan B. And then we discovered something else. And, you know, one of the things I have to admit is that, you know, usually when I am talking with startups and coaching and everything like that, I'm doing it in Silicon Valley. And there's a cultural difference. People have been used to hearing all this stuff. They go to, it's almost like we have startup churches. You know, people that do, they get the religion of startup and they do these things. And it's, it's, it, it, there's, there's a vocabulary and everything. And, and I introduced them to a, an acronym that they didn't know. And it's very important for you, OPM. And I was, I was just talking with, with Sari about this, right? OPM. Do you know what it stands for? Anybody I haven't told? Anybody know? I, I told you though. Anybody that I haven't told, do you know what that is? Other people's money. If you want to, ideally you don't want to use your money, you want to use other people's money. It's better, right? Because your money, you have to come out of your pocket, your investors and things like that. So what does that mean? Well, other people's money can be investment money to pay for some. But other people's money a lot of times can be uh, leveraging that you can use in, to offset your costs. So I was talking to, to uh, the guy from Sari and he explained that they've actually come up with this thing. It was a beautiful example of how they were going to use somebody else to acquire all these customers for them, give them full orders, big orders, a lot of customers, big orders, and they're willing to pay full price. Like, what's not beautiful about that, you know? No customer acquisition cost, no integration cost, you know, no price reduction, other people money, really beautiful stuff. So there are certain things you always want to be thinking about because guess what, you never have enough of your own money. Okay, um, let's go into this. Remember this from uh, day one, burn, burn rate. You know, as you get into your product development, you know, all your technical stuff, your, your burn rate goes way up. And what I told you is usually, in my experience, when things go bad is it happens at your top burn rate. And so you're actually doing this, and so you blow your budget by a factor of two, right? And you may not actually, you may actually die. You just run out of money, right? So that's, that's a bad thing. So what, what, what do you want to have happen? I'm assuming something's always going to go wrong, okay? But if I'm going to delay things, I'd rather delay it down here, right? Where it's inexpensive. It's like, okay, then i just extending this and then it goes up. That's okay. Oh, yeah, maybe my product come out late, but I'd rather my product come out late and I survive. So what do we do about it? Well, let's look at the problem things. The number one problem that I run into as a technical person is that the customer requirements are wrong. Okay, and you say like, wow, that's terrible. Those, those bad customers, they're giving me bad customer requirements. Well, it's actually your responsibility to go get the requirements from them. And uh, as I was just telling the group from Voxel, the problem is, is a lot of times they don't tell you all of them. It's like, and you go back and you find a new requirement and the normal thing is like, well, you never ask about that. It's like, oh, it drives me nuts, okay? The reason this happens, you're entrepreneurs. You're necessarily inventors. You're trying to find a solution to problems, right? Most of your customers are not solution makers. They are just doers. Their, their job is to turn the crank and keep the donuts coming out of the machine, like your Dunkin' Donut, right? That's their job. They, if the, well, for them, if something goes wrong, they find a workaround. Oh, instead of doing this, we stick our hand in the hot oil and we move it over here. And I was like, okay, that kind of works. It's painful, but we do it all the time. And it, they, that's how they do it, right? That's what they do. And they don't think about we should do this differently. They just find something and they just keep doing it. Hope the problem goes away. So one of the things then, let's start to talk about how do we do better customer requirements validation. 
And I will tell you right now, this is tricky. And you're usually your marketing team and your business development team are going out and doing this, but they absolutely need your help, the technical team, to do some of these things. Because as a technical team, you tend to think about these things differently. You break it down. You do workflows. You do, you do architectures. You, you think about these things. You, you, do, you, you think about testing, right? They're not thinking about that. You have to do it. You have to be involved. I started off as a technical person. The reason I know about these things is because I was being driven crazy because it was all going wrong. I figured, well, I'm as smart as they are, so let me go out and learn how to do what they're doing. Right? Okay, so let's say, what are the most likely things to go wrong? And there are a lot of them. I didn't get the market requirement right. And um, the thing is, is that a lot of times you'll find out they don't actually know what the problem is and kind of know what it is because they, they won't know it until they see it. And once they see it, they can tell you, yeah, that's, that, that works. That's what I want it, right? But they don't know because they've never seen one of these. So that's a problem. Uh, it, it can go wrong when the implementation doesn't meet their needs. Um, and the, la the last time, you don't want this, to, you don't want to find out about that after you've launched your product. You want to find out about it before and modify your product so it meets their needs. The types of things are obvious is like it, it doesn't work well enough. You know, it's got too many errors, it's too slow or something like that. Or it's, it's the, the one that's very common is it's incomplete. Oh yeah, it does that but I also need to do these three things. Well, why didn't you tell me about those three things? What is the answer? You didn't ask. So you gotta figure out how do I figure out if it's incomplete? Or another, another two that are, that, are, that are really irksome is, uh, yeah, but my people can't do that. It's, you know, but no, it works like this. I, I know, but my people can't understand that, right? And, and, and by the way, a lot of times that's, that's actually false because of the next thing. They say it's too hard to do because it's too new for them and they don't know if it's going to really work well. If I see ever, five of my other, other companies around here all doing it and doing really well, then I'll consider doing it, but I don't want to be the first one. And they'll come up with all kinds of reasons why, you know, to hide the fact that, yeah, I'm just uncomfortable with it. Or, and I'm going to blame it on my people can't figure it out, uh, you know, technically. Well, and you go in the back and you see their people and they're using smartphones, they're doing this, they're doing all kinds of other things like, you know, if you know how to do that, we're going to build this and it's going to be the same thing. No, no, it's too complicated. But these are the things that happen. And, and guess what? As long as they believe them, they won't buy from you. And the critical thing was for them to buy and to buy more. Okay, so you didn't get it, the implementation right, didn't meet the user's need, and that's a very large thing. The next thing is, ah, this is a nasty one. There's a competitor that's beating you up. And, and that can happen for a lot of reasons. They already, they already have existing products and they own a lot of customers and people are gonna say like, you know, working with Johnny's company is good enough. We don't, you know, we're happy. We don't wanna change, we're gonna do it, right? Well, my company's like, no, well, you know, we're, we're okay, right? I don't, it's not a problem, so I don't need to solve it. It's working good enough, I don't need to change. Some people will just change to change, but no, we're not gonna be it, most people don't. The new product is, they, the, your competitor, you created something, and they created something a lot better. They jumped over you, okay, that's a problem. Um, they have better marketing. You're a technical group, but you don't, you know, marketing is real important to be able to sell that stuff, but that can happen, so what can I do to with technology to make it easier for us to have a marketing advantage. What these guys did out there, they found this other company that's dealing with all of these businesses that need to, to buy supplies, and one of the supplies they need is food, and so they already have a whole bunch of customers, and uh, they were able to hook it to get, say, hey, could you guys supply the food? And they said, sure, you know, one point connection, not 50 connections, that's, that's a lot better, right? And so, we can use their marketing to do this. If we had to start over, then we're competing with them and you know, they, they're probably a better, better fit because they can also supply them with brooms and detergent stuff, okay? That they have a better price point. Now, depending on what type of thing you're offering, you may have things you can do technically to change your price point up. One of the things you can always do is, is sometimes you try to put too much into a product and that changes things. Remember, uh, 
was it, I think it was on uh, Monday, I was talking about HP and the computers, and I told you a laptop, they make about $25 of profit off of it, right? And yet they make like 50 to $70 of profit off of the, the power adapter, right? All right, so they, they, they do give you one power adapter with it, but they won't give you two, because <laughs> they want you to buy the power adapter, right? And some companies are really mean, I hate it. HP used to do this, they don't do it anymore, where every time they came out with a new, new model, they came up with a different power adapter, they changed the plug. That was nasty, right? Nasty, nasty, you shouldn't do that, right? But anyway, what you may consider is, is there some way that I can introduce something technically with a lower cost, but I have all of the options ready to go in and add more higher value stuff to it. And so some of you I've talked to you about how do you do that? How do I add something where I'm, I'm leading with this, but I'm gonna make all the money off this next thing, right? And that's a really good thing to do. But you can't do it if you haven't, haven't provided the hooks for those things and you haven't thought it through because you need to get that stuff in there quickly. Okay, so how do I help them doing the validation to avoid these problems? One of the things is uh, you need to make sure that it really addresses a problem the customers care enough about that they will pay money for it. A very common thing you will, you'll find out is, you know, is, yeah, that's a problem, and we'd like it solved, or I'm not willing to pay the amount of money you want it for it to solve that problem. Well, that's, that's, that's a key thing you want to get to. How do I ascertain that it's, it's good enough that they'll pay for it? Um, does it meet the criteria for success? Oh yeah, that's really good, that's really cute, but you know, we needed 90% accuracy and you only gave us 50. Okay, so how do you wanna get out there and try to test these types of things? Uh, it doesn't meet all the ecosystems. You get it out there and the first thing you wanna to try to find out is what are other things that are needing to connect to this that you haven't told me about? So interfaces to ecosystems get to be very important. If you're doing food delivery stuff, you have to say, well, what are their ordering systems? You have to, if there's a delivery, if you have other delivery vehicles, what do I need to integrate to there to, to use those vehicles, right, to get it to happen? Um, it doesn't work in a way that is acceptable. Now, this is important because you may think you understand what, it, what working means, and your team is, is using it, and it works, and your marketing team uses it, and they say, yeah, that works, but that's not the same thing as the customer using it says that works, right? And you have to try to figure out how do I, how do, I do all of those things right away. Of course, functional validation. Is the technology working well enough? This is, um, and the product comes to it. So uh, I don't know how many of you know how to do regression testing. Uh, so regression testing is where you set up and you have a huge set of tests and you beat up on your product as hard as you can. You do that a lot in software, right? You try everything, like, you know, when, hmm? Like, you take it to the maximum? Yeah, or, and sometimes you just take it in random things. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about, so, so, and especially when you get into compliance, you need to do a lot of that type of stuff. So, uh, you know, one application that we built for a pharmaceutical company, and we had to literally generate this much testing data. This is stacks of paper. Um, that uh, if to submit to the FDA. Uh, one thing it did was set, you know, for every button on the display, it, we had it press the button 10,000 times, and then go press the next button to that, and just report, yes, it worked, yes, it worked, yes, it worked, yes, it worked, right? 9,999 9, it worked, 10,000 worked, fine, you go to do the next button number two, boom, 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 boom. And then you do random tests on stuff, just to try to say, you know, this is bulletproof. Okay, so there, there are various different types of things you need to do for testing. Um, so you, you want to look at, did I just change the slide? Yes, yes I did. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so uh, you need to understand if the functional test, and sometimes you need, the, the critical thing with functional test is a lot of times using it with the customer's data. Okay, cost validation. Does this cost meet what I need to do? And is it w enough that they will cause them to actually buy? Sometimes you will find out that, yeah, it meets what they want to do, and they think it's good enough, and we will buy it in three years once the existing thing breaks. So, 
well, I don't want you to wait three years. I want you to buy it now. So when you find these things or the cost you stuff, you have to actually find out, is it good enough to replace exactly what you have today? OK, so how do you, what do you use? A very simple thing to use is paper mock-ups. Uh, you saw in the, um, when we did the product, we looked at that company's product requirements document, uh, PRD, right? They had, they had sample web pages for selling jewelry or stones or something like that. And those are completely, somebody just mocked it up, right? They just used uh, Illustrator and they drew it all up and didn't, and it wasn't a web page. It just looked like a web page. That's a mock-up. That's enough for you to sit there and walk through people and talk about, yep, you do this, and you hit this button, and this page comes up, boop, there it is, and you try it out. Now, you can also build a simulator. So, you know, you have an application, and it's just a front end that kind of looks like something, and you're pressing things, and, and there's, there might even be a guy behind the curtain who's feeding the data. Yeah, you know, you, you put in three, and he sends back ten or something. Like, okay, see, the, the thing worked, right? But you, you can run a simulator, and the nice thing about those is a lot of times you, you, you won't get a reaction from the paper stuff, but when they actually use it, then all of a sudden they'll react. Um, envisionment videos, and I'm going to show you one of those. Remember the other day we saw the Corning envisionment video, Dan, uh, Dan Glass, right? That was an envisionment video, and that was just like, imagine, just imagine. Well, there are other ones that actually get into the actual tedious things that have to go on. And I'm going to show you one of those in a little bit. And uh, a part of that is not only, you, usually you want to do is you want to explain what, what, this is what happens today, and then this is what's going to happen in the future. And then you tell what's going to be different. Another thing that you may have heard of are time and motion studies. So a time and motion study is when you go inside of a company, and usually you need your technical team to do this. OK, I'm going to, I'm going to watch this person work, and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to see everything they do. I might actually time it, right? And I'm going to see all the variations, and I'm going to, I'm going to make a flow chart for the whole thing, and I'm going to put the data around behind it. And, and a lot of times, they'll let you do that. Uh, I mean, I've done something where I watch people, and then I've asked, uh, would it be OK if I came in and worked a shift? And I'm going to say, you want to work on this? And I say, I'm willing to do it because I actually want to understand what all of the variations and parameters and everything can be. And so that's why sometimes it's good, it's even good for you to consider doing a custom job for somebody if it's, if it's lightweight enough just to be able to understand what the requirements are that they haven't told you, right? So, that, so a time and motion studies, you try to put that together. By the way, there's a very formal thing about time and motion studies where they're actually trying to use this for figuring out exactly how fast you know you should be able to put a bolt on this thing and this isn't isn't that type of thing but it's the general thing you're trying to understand all of the steps and you're better at doing the flow chart than they are they leave things off so in terms of general uh, types of prototypes you also have you know uh, similar for things we mentioned that you have hybrid things this is where you have a simulator part of it's fake and part of it's real and you just start putting components in that are real as your technical team puts gets them together we stick them in there you can find it you can have something that's a, um, um, a functional prototype too this is one that does everything that the real system is supposed to do but it's built with completely non you know non-standard hardware a lot of times the hardware and everything cost you 10 times more than you can have in your product but it does it right that's all it needs to be able to do. And uh, then you have an engineering prototype. A lot of, these, are, these are things that you usually see if you're building a hardware product. Engineering prototype is now it looks and acts exactly the way the product does, but it's not built with production parts. Because you know, it's, it's like, let's say I had to have uh, it's this bottle and stuff like this. And I actually, it's a metal bottle, and I actually had a guy sit there with a machine and make me a first metal bottle, right? Yeah. Now, I can't afford to do that each time, right? I need to use an injection molder and make the thing, but, but it looks exactly right, weighs the right amount, does all things, but that's an engineering prototype. It's, 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 
it's like the product, but it's not with product intent manufacturing. So you, you, you will run through that and you will see these things. Very few of you are actually doing uh, hardware stuff, so you know, it's a, we can talk about that. Okay, one of the, the terms that you will hear is requirements creep. What this means is you start and you have this set of requirements, and every time you turn around, somebody's giving you more requirements. Okay? And, and it, it just seems like it just drives you crazy. Uh, well, if you do agile technique, you're probably used to that because that's one of the things you have to get ready for is how do you do this. So there are various different approaches you can do it. But um, a rule of thumb, if you are building a product that really isn't out on the market today, there's not an existing thing you're trying to just compete against them directly, then half of the requirements that you start with are wrong. They're useless, they should be thrown away. The only problem is I can't tell you which half, right? Now, uh, it's the, 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 the creep part of it is that there's still 50% of the requirements that they haven't told you. And those are the ones you gotta really work about. Now, um, <clears throat> depends on what you're doing with your product. This, this actually could be good for you. Usually it's bad for you. Um, because uh, the, the general thing that people learn uh, most people in the United States learn is that when you own a house, right, eventually you want to remodel your house. You want to fix up part of your house. And so you and your wife, your family, they figure out all the stuff they want to do, and it's like, here's exactly what we want. And then you go to a builder, and you go to ferry builders, and they, they give you a quote on how much it's going to cost and how much time it's going to take, right? You sign it, and you start working. And they start tearing out things and building new things. In the meantime, you tell some people, oh, I'm doing a remodel. This is great. It's got to do this. And they say, oh, you've got to go see my friend's remodel. They just did one, and I really love it. And you go over and look at their house, and they remodeled their bathroom, and they've got something that you never thought about, and you've got to have it. Okay? So what do you do? You go back to your builders. Hey, builder, you know, uh, you know we, we thought some great ideas and stuff like this. And they say, uh-huh, uh-huh. And they say, well, we want to change the bathroom to have this. Okay. So you're going to have to, I'm going to have to do a change order. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm going to, you know, my total, the total job is going to cost you $50,000 now. Uh, this, this change that you wanted, it's going to cost an extra $10,000. Say, whoa, well, what was this extra $10,000? I mean, it shouldn't be like $300 because, no, 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 no. We've, we've already done this, this, and this, and it's $10,000. And you're kind of stuck because the guy's already tore your walls out and done some things and you sign a contract. Okay? The, the guy, you know, he's going home because, by the way, they know that you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to do this right. You're not going to give them all the requirements. And they're, they're, they didn't expect to make any money off of the original bid, but they're going to kill you on the change order. <laughs> okay? Now, if you're the guy that's, you're building this stuff and you're having to support it, it's a fixed cost, the change orders that your customer changes on you are terrible. On the other hand, if you're doing it for time and materials, kill them. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great, you know, they, they change their mind, okay? You know, yeah, if I bid this in at first, it was going to cost me $2,000, but now I have to change everything, it costs you ten. Yeah, it works, you know? So, um, but, Half of, the, half of the requirements might be bad and you're missing the other half. Okay, what are the other ways, to, how do you get rid of those unnecessary requirements? And this turns out to be really tricky. And um, one of the things that this book, The uh, Blue Ocean Strategy, talks about is how to be tough on your team and yourself about requirements. Because the normal thing is like, yeah, let's just add one more. Let's just add one more. Well, that adds to your cost, right? And so the whole thing is, how do I figure out what, if I, what am I going to add, what am I just going to increase, what am I going to decrease, and what am I going to eliminate? And it's really difficult with your team on the decrease and eliminate, right? So that's why you want to read a book like that to say, okay, what have other people done and how do they logically do it so they can do it? Okay, the other thing that is, is, is highly recommended to consider is, can I come up with a minimum viable product? Okay, this is not the product that you want it to be. This is the minimum usable for anything product. Okay, 
And a lot of times what you will find is you will start out with an MVP and then you, by the way, MVPs uh, in most of the world uh, is the most valuable player. So if you're at a, you know, yeah, but th this is a different MVP, right? And you want to actually figure out what I can do to test the water with it. And the reason you want to do an MVP is, is I can get it out less money and really fast. And, I can, and now people can actually try to use it. They can kick the tires on the car. They can turn on the radio and stuff like that. You know, or maybe it doesn't have a radio, but at least they can try something and they can tell you, does it work? You know, does this meet my need or not? And it would if it had a radio. Okay, fine, I'll put a radio on it. The other thing that's very, very important for you, <clears throat> we're talking technology here, but you need to make a business. And at, you know, once you get down the road with your business, you have to do things like hire salespeople. You have to hire support people. You have to hire training people. You know, you have to hire, um, um, let's see, what are, IT people, right? And so, you, you know, the, the co your costs go up. Now, let's, you know, if we did the Harry Potter thing and we hired all these people, the question is, do they actually work well? Well, if they, have not ha if they don't have a product where they actually are selling to people and people are calling in with support and they're worried about operations, you know, things, it's all theoretical. Um, and once again, if you want to have a soccer team and you want to go to the World Cup, you better start by having some practices and some scrimmages and then real games and work your way up. You don't want your first thing for the team to be the World Cup. You need to start slow. So what, if you come up with a minimum viable product, a lot of times what you're really doing is using that so that your salespeople and your support people can actually do sales and support. And you're going to figure out, do they know how to do it? Can they work together? If they can't work together, who do I need to get rid of? Right? And you want to do that when the risk is lower. So that's, that's the thing, the, a re key reason to do an MVP. Okay, so why did these get to be an issue with the customers? Um, the first one is kind of funny. They're nice to you. Okay, so a lot of you, when you go out and you work with, you work with you're trying to get customers, you're talking to people, you'll find one company that just is, they, they like you. They're working with you, and so they'll spend the time, and you can, you can um, work together on requirements, and they share data and all kinds of good stuff. <clears throat> the problem that happens is sometimes it's like, you're going through and you're building stuff. You're getting excited about your product and it's got these features and stuff. And they're looking at it and it's like, you know, he's got that feature in there and I'm sure somebody really wants that feature. I don't want it. I don't want that feature. But I like Henry. So I'm going to tell him, yeah, go ahead and put that in. Like, uh, that's, uh, you know, it kills you because they were being nice to you. Okay, that's, 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 that's a terrible way to get a bad, to get an unnecessary feature in. Right? That's an unsist requirement. Um, another one, very common, especially when you're working with customers and doing a lot of interaction, is they're embarrassed to admit they made a mistake. And this is like, okay, I insist that the, that the throughput rate has to be 100 per day. And then they find out, actually, it really needs to be 20 a day. But I made such a stink about it being 100 a day that I'm not going to say anything. Because 100 a day is better than 20, so it'll work. Yeah, but he may have increased your cost by four, right? Uh, or another one that's really bad is the customer you're working with has a manager. And they have a manager. And the way they convince their management that they should do this because they need 100 a day. And so if it's 20 a day, uh, they don't want to go back to their management and say, I messed up. You don't get bonuses for that. You know? They look at you, that's an idiot that you know, messed it up. And, uh, and in fact, sometimes they're just completely guessing at what that number was. They had to have a number, so they guessed, right? So this is a problem. You got to try to figure, we have to figure out ways, and I'll show you ways to get around that. OK, um, they haven't really this is one that got me in trouble at Harvard. Um, I was working with the director, 
she knew a lot about their stuff, right? And except that it's people three levels down that were actually doing the work, and she understood it theoretically. Understanding it theoretically and actually how it works are two different things. They were one to say, yes, boss, you got this. She was, you know, you're great, we love you. Yeah, that's good enough, good enough. Except if it really has to be done, no, it's not good enough. So what you really want to do is you want to you want to go and work with the real users. And, and sometimes that's difficult. They don't want you to do it, but you need to get down to that level. Then this is, this is probably the other one that's really bad that's an embarrassment feature. It's virtual DNA. And you know, the species around the world try to preserve their species. They try to preserve their DNA. This happens all the time. Well, ideas are like DNA too. You know, this guy, he told me something and it's his idea and it's like, wow, that's so good. I'm going to put it in our product and we're talking about it. They feel good about it, but uh, it turns out his idea is an ugly child. It's just, you know, nobody, nobody likes that, right? Well, that's a problem because they're going to fight to protect their child, right? No, my child is beautiful, right? And, and that's a problem. And to make things worse is if they've been bragging about this is now being into it, and this guy, is a, the, the person you're talking to was in this company, and they report up to these levels of management. Well, there are other people that report to them at the same peer level. If this guy is getting all kinds of good, good things for saying it got in, and then you find out this is bad, these other people are going to start shooting at him. And that's, that's a problem. That's a real problem. It's not your problem, but it becomes your problem. Okay. So, have, have any of you had a problem with getting solid customer requirements? Or getting ones that you think, this might be a squishy customer requirement? Do you have anything like that? We are working in video games. In video games, yeah. So you, you, you generally have an idea of what you're doing, right? Uh, and you've released a bunch of video games. You've got a bunch of users, and you're trying to make a platform, right? Now, the thing you want to do is like, well, what are the other video games we should be making? What are their functionality? And you may have people you can go to, right? But maybe they're just telling the same thing, and they're missing out on it. So that, that's one of the things that you, know, you have to ask yourself is, <clears throat> I, I represent the customer, and I have all these customers that use video games, and they want this. Now, where you can be blind is, it, what can I use a video game platform for that's not a game for these customers, but somebody else? And you have to say, oh, how do I get those requirements, right? Because that's, that's the thing. And that's, so that's so a lot of the things we talk about. When you go to look for that new group that you don't represent, this is where you have to worry about being blindsided. Something's going to hit you from the side. All right? So even on these things, the, remember, we we're going to talk the last day uh, about pivots. That's what happens when something goes wrong. Right? These are the things you've got to be prepared for and, and go over it. What about yours? Do you have any customer requirement issues? Right, and then and they and you might actually find out, for example, say, yeah, I, I want to, I want to have this played on my watch, right? But, and you know, I'm going to be doing this outside when it's really noisy. Well, I thought you were just, you know, sitting at home listening to your watch, and you didn't tell me that you're doing this out on a busy street, right? That's a problem, right? So, you know, these are the types of things you have to do. It's like, I, I, I need to find out not only what it does, but also what's around, you know, what else affects it in order to do it. This is what's the ecosystem it leaves to live in. So these, there, there are a variety of these things. Okay, so how do I, one of the things you need to do to avoid bad requirements. Um, first of all, try to get, even though you may have a primary, a primary, a uh, customer that's giving you most of the requirements and working with you, you have to have other customers. And you just kind of go back to them. And all you want to do is like, once you learn stuff, every now and then you want to go to these other people, says, just let me update you. 
on what we're learning. And they'll say, oh, okay, I, I'm willing to listen, right? And then you walk them through and see, did, you know, see if they react to anything. And surprisingly, a lot of times, they will give you a reaction. So that, that's an important thing to do. Run it by the other customers. Now, the thing that you, the, the reason, that's good, maybe they'll pick it up, but the customer that gave it to you says, well, that should be a requirement right away. Okay, so what you have to do is tell them like, oh yeah, we have a process. You know, where we have to go through and validate requirements now at this stage. We have to figure out, um, you know, do we have real concrete data about how it exists? You know, do we have testing data? Is the, we have to do an ROI estimate, you know, is it, if we're going to spend X dollars to do it, are we going to get more than X dollars back? You know, otherwise it's a negative and um, we have to postpone to a future version. That's always a good one. You know, we're going to do that, but we're going to put it in the next version, right? Those are the things you look at. Um, it's bad when, the, when your, your favorite customer, your champion, has promised their boss that it's going to be there because that gets really sticky. Um, we're not going to go into it. We're going to mention it. But another thing you can do is a sensitivity analysis. And um, so a sensitivity analysis is, well, if I change this, does that change the result in a meaningful way? So for example, if you're just doing a cost sensitivity analysis, you will say like, well, if the price of this, this component changes but from, you know, goes down by 10% or up by 20%, does that really affect my overall cost? And the problem that you find a lot of times is that we concentrate on the things that actually are not very sensitive, and the things that are very sensitive, we're not working on at all. And that's what sensitivity analysis will help you do. <clears throat> and um, so those are some of the things, but, uh, but that gets really complicated. And depending on what you're doing, you have very different types of sensitivity analysis. In order to do those, one of the things we'll do is talk about is our influence diagrams. OK, now you get to see something special. Um, <clears throat> you're going to get to see young Henry. Uh, back in 1986, uh, Xerox came. Uh, just the, the brand marketing team decided to, to say, to put a tagline on it. So it's Xerox, the document company. Before we've been the copier guys, right? Now we're the document company because that's, that's a $50 word instead of a $2 word, right? And so they did this. The problem was no one knew what that meant. Everybody, what, what, what does it mean to be a document company, right? And so um, we created this video. Now I've taken snippets out of this. This was done in 1986, but it, it's, it's, it shows you what you can do at a very low budget. Okay, so an all-in-one device is like those devices over there, scan, printing, cop, copy, right? They came out 15 years. Okay, I'm going to stop it right here. Um, 1986, you know, World Wide Web hadn't been invented yet, right? Didn't exist. There were no browsers, no www, none of that, HTTP, none of it. Three years away, okay? Uh, Java hadn't, hadn't even been started. James Gosling was its son. And, in, and four years later, he created this project called Green, and he wrote this language, language called Oak, right? And then they rebranded it three or four years after that and called it Java, right? And it was really great because they created JavaScript, which had nothing to do with Java, too. So, but, you know, that was branding, right? And then Google. Brandon Page were 13 years old in 1986. They hadn't invented Google, hadn't thought anything about that. They were still riding their bicycles around. Okay, how old were you in 1986, sir? I was 18. 18, so he, he already had a car. So, okay, so this was a long time ago. Maybe you should call me Grandpa Henry. Old VHS tape. Yeah, look at that guy.
Where's the volume? He was one of the best systems architects I've ever known. We fought like cats and dogs. No, John Pedersen, though. If you, anybody does natural language processing, he's one of the, the, the real guys. We had great actors. to write people's names and addresses and put a card in it. That's how you kept track of them. You could put it in alphabetical order. Progress? Yeah, 
Okay, um, hey, I don't know what to do with this message box. Oh, that's one of my favorite features. Uh, all you have to do is uh, handwrite a message in there and it will uh, print it out on a letterhead and send it along with the, uh, with the rest of the stuff. Well, maybe you should tell me that. Yeah, I think some things are in order, don't you? No, sir. See, Eloise. Great working with you. She mentioned something about next year, too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, looking forward to next year. Thanks. Uh, you want to sign it? Yeah, sure. No free time. Okay, no one did. Just put the two copies on top of the agreement and put the whole file in the machine. Like so? Okay. Just try to start. So what's going to end up? Well, it's going to read the cover sheet and figure out where to send everything. And then it really will ask us for the phone number of Willie's Hotel. Okay, so uh, we've done the number for Willie's Hotel. Seven, four, two, five. There we go. Uh, here's the copy for Harry. Hey, what can you do as my camera? Sorry, it takes the handwriting off the cover sheet that we filled out and makes a customized version for every copy that it sends. We're all done. Uh, well, what about the uh, other faxes that have to be done? No, we're really all done. See? Uh, it's sending the fax to Sue in Los Angeles right now. After it's done with that, it's sent it to Willie, and it's already sent the uh, copy for Eloise in the mail room. What do you mean it sends the mail room? Well, actually... Remember, there was an email yet? It's going to take the note that we wrote and print it out on some letterhead. Take the address, print it out on some labels. When the mail, mail folks come in in the morning, they'll just uh, send it right out. Hey, that's not magic. Okay, and uh, so here's the original. Why don't you stick uh, Harry's copy in his box in the original line, and uh, we're out of here. So the, um, let me stop about this. The, the computers being able to read the same thing. Oh, so the, the thing that we did, the reason we did this is because the senior management was wondering, what does this mean, the, the document company? And, you know, if we thought, if we thought of all kinds of, there, there, were other demo, there were other things in here that are more elaborate than that, but we had to start with something so simple, but it was, it would blow their mind, right? And believe me, in 1986, it blew their mind that you could do these things, right? So we set it up, and you saw all of that was fake. We, you know, n none of it was real, right? Uh, and I was named Tom. Uh, so, you know, but it, it was started us, and then we, we went to it, and we had to be able to show them at least the first one is real. And so what we did at first in this is we talked about, um, here was the problem, he was, gonna, he was gonna go and just make photocopies and stick them in envelopes and then send them through the, the mail service, right? And instead, they use the fax machines to get things out. They use, they print stuff in the mailroom. Ooh, and that's something. I scan it here and print it over there. Never been done before, you know. Uh, but it was easy enough to do. Uh, and so you know, you just had to you had to walk them through this. And then you give them more sophisticated things. But first, you got to give them something very real, very easy to understand. So that's what I did. Now the the next thing was actually going to be. And I think I'm going to skip this right now. But we're going to, what we're going to do is we're sitting there talking about, we walked, we're watching the video, and we're saying, oh, this is how this is done, this is how this is done, you know, boom, boom, boom. And we're doing that so that the upper management, even though it was the te technical upper management, could understand. Right? We had to convince them. Uh, this actually was very successful. Uh, they, they went ahead, they did it. But the problem is they didn't actually implement any of these things. Why? Remember what I said to you the other day about big companies? Well, Xerox was a very profitable big company at the time. They were making money off copy machines and some printers. Printers, digital, you know, laser printers were a very uncommon thing in 1986. I mean, we had them, but there were, there were, you know, there were the first laser, small laser printers were on the market a year or two before. Very uncommon and very expensive by, by the standards. And so um, Xerox management says, great, we know what it is now. Let's just keep doing what we did yesterday because we know how to make money on that, right? 
And as you're laughing, but that's what it is. They, you know, big companies want to keep doing it because they're not entrepreneurs like you. So let's, let's keep going with uh, this. If, if you want to watch this later, I can play the rest of it. But um, you get back to the slides. Okay, so one of the things you could do for validating is create an envisionment video. Hey, look, guys, it's super easy now. You got these things, and they take great video. I mean, we were using really big cameras, and you actually had to edit tape, you know? You put the tape in, you splice, you cut it, and things. It was really painful to do that, right? And, and yet, you know, we, we put it together. Did we have scripts? Yeah, we kind of wrote a script. You think we memorized it? No, we were ad-libbing it, doing the whole thing. We had to keep shooting it over because we kept getting it wrong because none of us were memorizing the scripts, right? Uh, and, uh, but you can create something and you can show it to people and they're going to like, oh, yeah, I kind of get it now, right? And in fact, you can show it to them three times and they get it a little better each time. And you can give them a copy and they can go tell to people. It's like, this is, this is kind of what it is. Very, very useful. Consider doing that with all of your stuff. Every single one of you should be creating a story and showing how we do it in a simple way. You know, collect props. Your props, you know where they are? That's the stuff like on stages when you're doing a play, you have you know, something that's a prop. It's just, it's just meant to hold a place, right? So people use it. You need props. Now, there are different types of props. Um, there's real materials from customers. And it's really fun because you go and you go walk, you go talk to a customer and um, say they have some books that you're going to make audio books from, right? You, you, you actually want to get some of those books. And so when you go to talk to somebody else, you say, like, like this one. And they're like, oh, okay. Because when you talk abstract books, they don't do it. It's like, oh, this is the book. Oh, yeah, that would be really good, right? Or um, you want to create your own props. The other day we talked about these guys are creating anime, right? And they got these characters they're using. I said, make a 3D model of them. You got, you know, you got character number one, two, three, and four, and you can use these as props. And I said, you can even do like, you know, kids do with dolls. They're like, hey, I'm coming in, you know, I want to do this. Oh, I'm coming over here like it. Believe it or not, the customer gets it better when they can actually visualize it, when they see concrete things, when they see these things are real things. It's, it's amazing what you can do collecting these things. So you'd be always asking, you go to visit a customer and uh, they're, they're, doing, they're, they're making something or they're using something, say, hey, do you mind if I take, take some of those so I can show the people back? And say, oh yeah, fine, go take this. Or they say, no, we gotta do it. can I take a picture of this? Oh yeah, I can take a picture of it, right? These are useful things because then when you show them to other people, for some reason, it's like, that's real, but when you talk about it the way you're, ta you're used to think about it, that's not real. And you say so you have to move into the regime where they take it. Uh, create stories with your props. Just like I said, you know, this guy's coming in, he's going to say this, and this guy's doing this, and this guy's a real sarcastic guy, and so he's saying something mean, mean, mean like this, and this guy's a nice guy, and the other nice guy's coming. You know, you tell a story, right? You could be walking it through about, here's how we're going to do Going, our drone's coming into the thing and it's flying around like this and it's got this thing, but we have this problem. You walk them through that. Don't let them do it. With voxel, you're going to say, okay, you know, here's, here's some pictures of a bunch of houses and, you know, it's not even your stuff. Here's what it looks like at a 360. Great. It's a prop. It's something that gets it going. Then you work through the real scenarios with a simulator. So now that you've kind of got something and you think you know what you're doing, as fast as you can, you create a simulator, and you don't work with the man, you first show it to the managers and get them to do it, but then you want to go to the real users and have, pretend like you're using this. And I say a lot of times if it's a, an over-the-air type of thing, you have somebody on the other side who's just feeding the stuff. There's no back-end engine to it. The back-end engine is you, right? And so you, you do things like that. Or if you need to, it's like, I do this on my phone, and you hit a button, and then, oh, look, it came up. This, you know, it could be just a PowerPoint thing. When you hit a button, it changes to a new slide. That's all you need to have. But you walk them through. You know why? Because they start working on it, and say, like, 
hold on, but what happens when this happens? What do you mean this happens? Oh yeah, 3% uh, of the time we run into this and we have to do something different. Nobody told me about that. Aren't you glad you found out about this early on? Oh yeah, you're really going to be happy to find out that this is a requirement early on before you've hard-coded your, your solution. You got that, so using a simulator this way and working not just with the managers, go work with the real people as much as possible. And then when you're working with those real people and they say, oh, this happens, say, wow, you know, could you give me a few examples of that? Could I get the documents or uh, see what, you know, give me samples of this thing so I can go back and talk to your manager? Oh, yeah, 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 I, I, I want you to go talk to your management. And you, you come up with it. Now, it might be proprietary, so you can't go show it to another customer. But then you could take their real stuff and mock up something like their real stuff. And when you're going to talk to the next customer who's not as close to you, you say, well, we go through the normal process, you go through the simulator. And then, by the way, they have these, these, these exceptions that happen about 3% of the time, and it looks like this. And the other customer is like, oh, yeah, we have that too, but for us it's 10% of the time. Ooh, really good. Or the other customer says, no, we don't have that because we deal with a different market and they do it. But we have this, okay? What do you mean you have this? Well, there's this other thing. So they come up, by, because they saw one exception from customer one, they come up with another exception in their market that they would never have told you about had they not seen the exception in the first customers. And you can do this with a simulator. You can do this with a functional prototype. You can do this with a hybrid thing, but you constantly want to be doing it. Now, the technical team, I'll tell you this, you need to provide tools that make that easy for whoever's going out into the field and doing it. You need to bake that in to whatever you're going to do. Okay. This one is, is really a cool one. Um, break your prototype. We used to do this with, with uh, when we uh, we build a system that we were using with this customer, and we get everything worked, debugged, and everything, and then I'd have them go in and put if def statements inside the code so that we could put in uh, these are macros. And so if you you set a switch at the beginning, it gave you the good one. Or if you turn off the switch, it gave you the bad one. And the idea was you're sitting there doing a demo, walking your customer through on this, and you know when they hit the next button, it's going to break, right? It gives them a result they don't want. So you have to do it, and they hit the button, and it's like, oh, oh, this is wrong, Henry. I was like, oh, oh, okay, that's wrong. Uh, don't worry, not a problem. You know, hey, Joe, could you fix this? And they go, and they already know it's going to happen. So they then just recompile, relink. And they go, oh, here's the new one. And they go and tell each oh, wow, it was so easy to fix this stuff. Okay, why do you want to do that? Because you don't want them to be afraid to tell you what's wrong and what's broken or not. You would prefer them to think you could do magic it's just to do it because you've got to get the requirements you want to do as fast as possible. That's, that's a very important thing to do. Um, and you might want to show uh, what they want, but you want to change it around. Sometimes you might actually want to do the mock-up wrong and get them then to say, oh, no, it's not like this. Because if you know that it's wrong and they're still not saying anything, what does that mean? That means they're not really reacting, right? You want to, you want to have it and say, oh, well, that was our plan. Let me show you plan B. Oh, yeah, I like plan B a lot better. You have to force them to react. You have to force them to give you more information. And you know you want to do this as soon as possible. You had a question? Yes, about breaking the prototypes. Um, what about what if it is a physical prototype, like a device or something? Because okay, well, you know, um, with his uh, drones, you probably you know you, you you might want to do, you might have a physical prototype that's going out and do it, but you may actually want it to um, do something wrong. Now you may you may you may actually choose the software to have it the drone not fly all the places and say hey hold on it missed this spot and you can have that conversation so it depends on what you're doing but the, once again in order to kind of push it out there you have to do things that you know you you want to work with various different people to get these information out. A B testing. A B testing is a different. 
Uh, with the game before they launch it. So beta launches. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they have alpha and... Yeah, alphas and beta and stuff. And, and the thing is, is that the, the, the problem is, is you, if you wait until alpha and beta time, mm -hmm. everything's pretty much coded or, or built. What you want to do is move way before that. So you move these things into your basic functional prototypes, all this type of stuff before it gets there. Because in, in the, if you're building hardware, this doesn't work real well. What you're going to have is you're going to have a series of things come out. So you have the product, product launch, that's it. Right before that you have your beta, you may have an alpha. Yeah, a lot of times an alpha is done with um, uh, an engineering prototype. So it's, it's, it looks right, it works right, but it's not. It's like 10 times more expensive than it should be. So you do that. Now, coming down here, you know, you can, you can put in uh, other things during your, sim your, your early prototype test, basic functional test. This isn't even a complete machine, but I can show you that it does this one portion right. Is that good or not? And you can start to, to you can put things there. Or you can come, so this is a functional prototype. So you're only doing one part of it. It's not even the whole thing. So it could be like with his drone, I can't do all the other stuff, but it can at least fly all around the thing and not blow up. Okay, good. So I can test this. Uh, what you might want to do is show them, you know, uh, the, the drone can run this long, and I'm going to show you that what happens when it does it, when you go longer than that, it goes thump, right? Well, you need, to, you need them to see that. If they, didn't, if they, if they thought that the, they needed this much and actually they need that much, and then you, so if you, show them the, if you show them going a little beyond that, it fails, they're going to say, oh, that's a real problem because you didn't do this, this, and this. You didn't tell me you needed that, right? And you can go down here with the simulator and do, do these things. You just you put things in, you try it out, and you change it, okay? Uh, the other thing that's also often a good idea is People say, I need 80% accuracy on this. And go in and do something and give them 50% accuracy. And let them take a look at the results and find out they're saying, this is good enough. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know? So sometimes test the, test the negative. Go in the wrong direction and find out when do they start to scream, right? Because otherwise, sometimes they give you, exaster, you know, exaggerated requirements. And you gotta, you got to try to do that, get around that. Okay, um, let's go on. Uh, oh, yeah. This is another one. A lot of times, people won't give you any solid response until you use their data. And uh, as an example of this, this one project I was doing, uh, we had to do image processing. We were trying to digitally use a scanner to give you something as good or better than a copier would. And uh, so we, we had all these example documents that we thought were really hard. They had pictures that were really hard. And, and we were showing the, the, the people that were, that were in charge of it, and they're like, oh, yeah, yes. And we said, oh, so, you know, so this isn't important. We said, oh, well, your manager told us it's important. No, it's not important. Well, they told us it's important because of this thing, the Southwest Airlines document. Oh, my Lord, the Southwest Airlines, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, until we talked about their problem, it wasn't a problem. As soon as we mentioned it was their problem, then, then just like you hit, you hit a landmine and boom, the whole world blows up on you, right? That's why it's very important to use their data. Otherwise, they, they, they don't pay attention. It's not real to them. You're just taking up their time. Um, help them sell their management. If you're especially working with a big company, then uh, the guy that you're talking with is down here, and yet the people are making decisions are up there. You have to sell it up here, especially if this is the guy that has to write the check. Be very careful to find out when you, as you're talking to these people, and they, they will talk to the technical team much more freely than they'll talk to, to the salesperson or the, or, or the other biz dev people. You talk to the people, you ask, well, how much does uh, your boss sign for? You know, what's the biggest check that they can write? Oh, they can write up to $10,000. Okay, great. Mine's costing 50. 
Okay, what about your boss's boss? Oh, they can sign up to 25,000. Okay, what about your boss's boss's boss? You know, and then, oh, 100. Okay, great. Now you know who you have to sell to, right? And so you need to help them explain to their management why this is the best thing and they have to buy it. So it, this, is, this is one of the things that you can do to make things up. Remember, when you're an entrepreneur, it's a tag team. It's just like playing you know, soccer, playing football. You need all of the people there. Theoretically, all you have to do is score more goals than the other people. You think all you have to do is have attackers. But, you know, sometimes you need defenders, right? It would be tough not having a goalkeeper, right? You, you kind of lose games that way. So it's a tag team. The technical team has to be ready. You know, they, now, if you're in a big company and, you know, everything's highly organized, the technical team doesn't get anywhere near that. You're not a big company. You've got to think differently, okay? Ah, uh, the problem person. Um, when I was doing that project at Harvard, uh, they invited the Harvard CTO to come in. So he's a smart guy, really smart guy, CTO at Harvard and everything, and he was super excited about it, and he wanted to talk about all the things with new technology, da, 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 which meant we couldn't get the meeting done because none of his people would interrupt him because he's the CTO, okay? And I was like, this is a problem because on our first day of meeting, we only got 10% of the stuff done. Okay, because he wants to keep talking about technology and we need this other thing. So we came up with a thing. We said, like, you know, we are starting a subcommittee on new technology. And we put the CTO on the subcommittee. And he said, you're in charge of it. We run it. We're going to do this thing. And you'll report out next time. Well, the thing is, is the CTO never has enough time to actually do that, right? And so you come to the next meeting and say, hey, you know, you're on the agenda to give an update on this. So, you know, I can't make it. You guys go ahead without me. Because they, they didn't do their homework, right? And so, but they, then they leave you alone and you got the rest of it done. So when you run into to problem people, there are different ways that you can do to, to, uh, to do it. But, you, you know, the thing you have to worry about is sometimes if you insult that person, you don't tell them the right respect, then you're in trouble. You're never going to make the sale. So uh, the thing is, for the technical teams, you're always going to run into people that want to talk to you about technology, right? You're not interested in technology per se. A little bit's fine, but you're needing to know about their business. Okay, I've talked about breaking prototypes, mocking up. You know, I think I've covered most of this. Let's go to the next one. Okay, drawings are your friend. You can never make enough drawings. And uh, you did, uh, some of you, I talked to you about your, your product roadmap. Some of you did really detailed ones, right? And that's really great, except if you show that to their management, their management, not gonna get it. You have to create dumbed down ones for the management sometimes. So you, you're gonna have lots and lots and lots of product roadmaps, right? There's the one that the, the, the manager who actually owns the problem, they want to see every single detail, okay? The manager who's needing to, to sign the check, they need to see a different thing. The guy that, that's up in the thing that has to report to senior management, they need the easy one, you know, roadmap for dummies. That's what they need. So you're going to create all of these things. Um, flow charts and things like this. Flow charts are great. Um, I had a, a buddy uh, that he had to solve two big problems inside of HP. These were huge problems. They were both printer problems, two different types of printers. And the problem was that it got so complex and it was done by so many thousands of different people over so many years that no one really actually understood how it worked anymore. And, you know, you, you couldn't do anything. So what he did was a very simple thing. Is he would go to the first group and says, well, tell me what your group does. And, you know, and he would just sit there and make a block diagram, do some things, and say this can go on this. And who, and who do you need to work with? I need to work with these guys. Okay, so go, boom, go talk to those guys. Okay, you're getting things for this. Is that, oh, no, you also get something for this? Oh, let me draw this thing. And he just started following his way along, right? And, and everybody thought he was a doofus at first. He didn't know anything. But by the time he had gotten about 20% of the way through it, he had the single most knowledge 
of how their system worked. And he was only 20% of the way through. And, and how you know that, 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 you've, that this is working is one of them says, hey, uh, could you give me a copy of that? Right? And, and it's funny because, and then once you do that, then, then everybody else wants to add more to it. And these are the types of things you can do. So when you do workflow diagrams of something going through a project, you go and you, you take it around to as many people as you can in their organization, other organizations, because someone, someone's going to say, hey, you're missing this. You know, there's an interface here to a third party system that you didn't put in there. Oh, does everybody use the same 30 person? Well, our company they do, but other companies they use, uh, you know, B, C, and D. Great, you find it. You have to do these things. By creating drawings, it really works. Um, and um, start very, very simple. Do one level, don't give them the engineering one. He has, a great, he has a great product roadmap that's, that's really useful. It's got all the details. Don't give that to the, to the management. Don't, don't do that, okay? Uh, create a now versus then drawing set. Uh, you know, it, we didn't watch that part of the video. But you know what, in that video, I was acting through how we were gonna do it the old school way. We're gonna take the things, we're gonna go to a copy machine, make four copies of it, take them, put them in an envelope, stick a stamp on it, and mail it. That's what we're gonna do, right? That's the now. And then, we, then what we talked about was the then. Oh, now you got this thing, you just run through the machine one time and it did all of them for you, and it says it faster, and you, know, it's, and, you, know, you didn't even put a stamp on anything because somebody else did that for you. Great. Now you can do the same thing. It's like, here's how your work process works. Here are all the people, and they hand it this way, and they do this. Okay, great. Now in the future, it's going to be, we're going to take all these things out, it's going to go here, it's going to go there. Now look at that, great. But, but what about the, uh, the guy that has to stamp it? Like, that, you didn't put that in the now. Oh yeah, well, you didn't ask me about that. But they, because they're seeing the now and the then, they can say, oh, you forgot this. Once again, it's how you force it out with drawings. Um, oh, what did I say here? Yeah, as I said, it's not uncommon for you to become the most knowledgeable person. You go to a customer site, and after you've been with them for a month or something like that, it turns out you can tell more what happens than they can more accurately because they get caught up in the fact they're just doing it. Okay, this is a perfect example of a myth. This is what your investors and everybody want to see. We're running this thing like a well-oiled machine. You see, we're going to start with this. We're going to generate a hypothesis. We're going to do some discovery. And it's going to be done by this date. Then we're going to do this. Then we're going to do this. Then we're going to do this. And bam, we're done. And it never happens that way. OK, it's always an iterative thing. That, that's a myth. But it looks really good. You know, after you're successful, and you know, you, you went all around like this, now you can tell the story. Boop, it was a straight line. You see, we did this, did, did, did this. And it took this much time. And you know how much time it takes because you know when you got it done. But you can't ever do that from the beginning. That doesn't work, right? Instead, what you have to do is start like this. This is like the guy that was going around. You find, oh, well, a customer knowledge our services, we have to get the team knowledge in, then we're gonna give it over to the customer, we're gonna do this. These things have to, on the track record, have to feed in this. This is how you start. My recommendation is you get piece, big pieces of paper, A3 size paper, that's A3, right? The ones that big. You get eight three size paper, you carry it with you, you take three or four colored pens, and you sit there, and as they tell you, you start drawing it in, and then the next guy looks over and says, hey, you gotta do this, and you just put it in, and then you formalize it, you take it to the computer and do it. And, but then you print it on the eight three size paper, and then you take it to the next guy, and let them write on it. They like to do that. You'd be surprised what they'd be willing, if you give them a pen, what they'll write, versus if you don't give them the pen, they won't tell you. Okay, if you're used to, to doing databases, it's an uh, entity relationship database, right? How does this thing connect to this? How is, and when you do ordering systems and things like that, you should be able to get to this level of granularity. But as, as, as Sari knows, you know, when you go and interface with 100 different customers, even if they're using the anomaly the same tool, they're doing it 100 different ways, and it gets pretty ugly. So, but you need to still try to figure out a proper structure for doing that type of stuff. Uh, and there are other ones that you can do for, for these drawings. That other ones, this one is very detailed, it tells you all the columns and everything like that. This one is, is more, more visual. This type of stuff works better for talking to the management, 
this type of stuff works better when you talk to the IT department, right? Um, here's another one. This is an influence diagram where you, you say, well, what's going to affect production quality is how much is coming to the policies and things like this. And that quality then det helps determine what the cost is. Boom, boom, boom. We did this the other day. And, you know, it's like you, we had things that started like three or four things. And within, what, five minutes, we had like ten things, right? And you start saying, oh, this thing goes to this, and this thing goes to that. Uh, you, you'd be surprised how these things work. But you need to draw it out. So um, let's, let's give an example. Let me see what time we have. We have about a half an hour left, I believe. Right? Okay. So let me switch over. Oh, come on back. I knew this was going to happen as soon as I switched it. It was going to go to sleep on me. Okay, recognize me. Come on. Okay. So, here's the deal. Um, a customer has come to us and we need to have a, a solve a problem with soybean fungus. These are fungus that grows on the leaves which killed a, a soybean plant. And um, it really reduces the yield when your plant dies, right? You get like nothing off of it. And the uh, farm hands have, have a hard time identifying the right thing because here's some example pictures, right? And, and there's all kinds of group things that happen to a leaf. Some of them are soybean fungus, some of them are other things, and they can't tell it apart very accurately. And the problem with that is because if they have the soybean fungus, they have to spray some uh, uh, chemicals on it, and the chemicals are expensive, and it takes time, and it's probably not good for anybody if you have, have un you know, you shouldn't use a chemical if you don't need to, right? And so what they wanted to do is be able to go around and have a farmhand say, ooh, this looks like a bad leaf, take a picture of it with their cell phone, and then, bing, it tells you good or bad, right? That kind of makes sense. That way you do it. Well, right now what they do is they have people take a picture, it sends it to the site, and there, there's a room with 300 people in it, and they're looking at the picture, and they're trying to decide if it's good or bad, and they hit a button, good or bad, and then it goes back. I mean, this is done. This is actually, this is a real thing. This is a real thing. This happened about five years ago. Okay? So you want to say, well, geez, you know, you can't be doing better than that. Let's, let's build an expert system to recognize and do this type of stuff. So that's, that's the problem we have. Okay? So now, understand, it's not like you're just looking at one leaf. You have big fields of soybeans, right? And, you know, you got it, it, it starts in one place, moves in other places. You got all kinds of things. And, you know, and this, this is a farm. This is half a mile. It goes half a mile to right here. And this is a half a mile. And I know that because remember I told you in the first day I, I got shipped to work on my uncle's farm in Kansas for two years? That's the farm. My uncle's dead and he doesn't own the farm anymore. But I know this farm fairly well. So, um, and, he, and we used to grow soybeans here, 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 and there. No, no, sorry, there. Um, and so, uh, but these farms are big. And now, you know, this is just one half mile by half mile section in something that's, that's 700 miles by 300 miles. So there's a lot of this stuff. And disease spreads. Wind spreads it. You know, the animals spread it. All kinds of stuff. And it's a big problem. So here's the imagined solution, right? Let me just get rid of that. So you want to take a picture. It wants to go to its cloud service. It's going to have an AI system that has been trained, and it's going to say yes, no, and it's going to send a, send a message back to the guy. Well, we figured out right away, you also had to send a, a report to his manager, right, with the combined stuff, because this guy's just getting yes, no, yes, no, right? And you probably also want to create a map for, for what it is. So this is the basic process that we see that we want to do. And what you, what you start to say is like, well, what else did we miss, right? And then that's when this gets interesting. So you go and start talking to them. And let me get rid of this. 
how do I hit delete? I took the keyboard off, so I don't know how to do delete. Guess got to put the keyboard back on. I'm going to go on there. Okay. So, what else might you want to do? Well, this is nice, but... Hello? Um... Well, this is a useful piece of information, right? You know, in fact, what you'd like to do is have a time map. Where is it going? And I don't know why it keeps doing that. So maybe what, what we want to do is we want to add other stuff to it. So what happens if we add weather information? So we know which way is the wind blowing. And you say, well, if it's here, then out of that, if I know where the wind's going, I can actually predict where it might go next. Ooh, that's a different value proposition, right? Because now it's not just a reactive thing, it's a, it's a, it's a proactive stuff. So if it's, if it's right here, and the wind's blowing strong this way, we better warn these farmers over here and tell them to start looking. The, or, you know, maybe you can even figure out that if you know that you're probably going to get it, if you spray just a small amount of the poison on it, you'll stop it from happening. That would be a big deal, right? So if, if that were going to be a happen, then you know that, I don't know what's with this thing. I don't know, gremlins. So this then wants to go over to the managers even if they weren't the managers whose field it was because you got the prediction, right? Now the other thing you might want to have is what happens if these guys give you treatment information? Okay, well if they tell you what they did to it, you can tell, well did that work or not? Because you can see is it still spreading? And that provides other information. Now let's look at other customers. And you always want to look for other customers. Well who else cares about this? Well, guess what? The government probably cares because the agriculture department wants to know what's going on. So you can have one thing that's going to the, the government. By the way, that's more money for you, right? You're going to charge the government because you're giving them this information. You're going to charge the farm managers to give them the prediction information, right? You're going to then, who else needs, oh, you know this treatment information? I got to do the the treatment company. So the guy that might be flying the airplane and spraying the stuff, well, they need to know that they're going to have to do a lot more of it and where to go. And I'm going to tell them who are going to be their customers. More money, right? You know, these are the things that you, as you start to think about this, you'll go and you'll talk with your customers and you'll start to get other things out of it, right? You know, another group that, that wants to know about this, the people are going to be buying the soybeans because they want to know how to predict how much is soybeans are going to be because there are markets that, that set the prices months ahead of time, right? So they don't even know, like, hey, it's going to be a small crop, let's up the price because they're going to be a lot less. So you can see how this goes. Now, what does this mean to a product roadmap? So, we're, we're doing the thing, let's assume we get this to work. Well, let's say we're very successful with it. Well, given the same platform we had, we're looking at spots on leaves from fungus, maybe those spots can come from six other things, like little bugs, aphids, and they get on it and they do it. I know about aphids <clears throat> because my wife make, uh, plants roses and aphids are her, her friend. They just constantly are eating her leaves. So, but aphids make little marks like that too, but they're different from the fungus one. So now I can actually ap apply the same thing and I do fungus plus aphids for soybean leaves, right? And I can sell that as enough service. So your soybean services cost you $1,000 a year 
Uh, if you want soybean plus A, it's cost you $1,500 a year, and you know, more money. And, it, and you could start to say anything that's doing with, with soybeans is going to go this way, and I'm going to keep adding more things to it. But maybe I actually jump and do something besides soybean. I do corn, corn fungus, right? Well, that's a different product. Charge another thing. Or remember, you just keep adding products to your list and finding new ways to get money from it. Or we get, we get Brack to give us an outside drone, and now we, instead of having the farmer hand go around, click, 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 like this, he flies his drone around, looks at different ones, and sends it all back. Uh, that's good. Okay, now the other thing that you start to look for is um, attached revenue. Attached revenue is when you can sell like an extra power charger for the, the laptop. You like to do that. What are other things you could do attach here? Well, remember those big fields? And initially you had a farmhand going along and he finds a leaf and he takes a picture. He thinks this is bad. You know, I'll take a picture, right? And then he's going on. Well, he's going to go take, what, 100 pictures, 500 pictures that day? And all of a sudden, now uh, he's going to say, like, yeah, boss, we have some problems in field number two. Well, where in field number two? Uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, it's not good. What, what is this? Like, so maybe what he has is he has these little simple things, little stakes with an RFID tag on it or just even a number, and he's putting them out there. So at least when they go back and look at try to figure out where it is, there's a map where all these things are, and you can do it. And I'm going to sell him those stakes for $500. <laughs> now, you can reuse them, right? But they'll lose them. And they'll but it's fine. You know, there are other things. Find out what does it take to make it easier. I was telling somebody that that, that, uh, that nice HP uh, white printer over there, you could buy, it's got these two paper trays at the bottom that hold, one of them holds like that much paper and the other one holds different size paper. You don't need to have them. You could just buy the thing with the little paper tray. But nobody wants it with a little paper tray because somebody has to keep filling it. So they, they will spend, they'll try to get the absolute maximum dollar amount for the, the printer in terms of cost benefits. There's no, there's very little profit on the, on the copy of printer, right? But they kill you on the paper trays because it's a convenience factor that people want. And all of you need to keep looking at convenience factors. Okay. So that's, that's a little demo. I'm going to actually take and gonna do more with this uh, as we go along. When, if you need to, I'd be happy to sit there with you and walk through the stuff. And so the guys with uh, the animation stuff, we, we actually did quite a bit of that the other day. Okay, so now let's go on and finish this up. So you need to do those diagrams and show how things are related because then you can get all of these missed things. You can, you can find where something should have hooked in. You can also find other things that you can sell, the attached stuff, and this makes your whole life a lot easier later on, and you can do this early on in the process. You always want to get the, the data. Somebody asked me about testing. The critical thing about testing is having good testing materials. You've got to know this is good, and it should give you this result. And um, as you start to, to run your systems, and you have prototypes that are actually really running, you want to save all of the inputs and outputs as you go along so that you can use it to test things later on. Um, and um, and we'll, we'll talk about tornado diamonds. So remember, you're doing your, your product roadmaps. You have the main thing. Figure out when there are little offshoots on it. These offshoots could be uh, a, you know, attached offshoots. It could be an extra service. I want to do training for people. Because a lot of times people need to be trained or else they're not going to use it right. It could be services. I will, uh, you, want, you want me to come sh do it for you? Okay, that's a professional service. I'll, I'll come do it for you, right? Or uh, you have other things going. So as you go through this, you will figure out what you want to do. Now, there are, we're going to get into a variety of tools and everything. Uh, but one of the tools I ran across recently is from Envision, Envision app. And um, the problem that they found was that when people were creating an uh, uh, interface on a phone, an app, is that they would, they would go back and forth, back and forth, and everybody is wanting to change something. And it was really hard for them to actually uh, control all of this, this change process and opinion, especially about look and feel. UI, UX stuff is subject to a lot of things. 
And so what they, they have is a, they have a, a simulator. So you can create something that's like it's iOS or, or, or Android, and you can, it's, but it's all mocked up. And so if you hit things, it goes to a different screen and reacts a different way. But they made it so that you could comment. So if somebody else is doing it, and they say, oh, I, don't, I like this, or this button needs to be moved over here, and blah, blah, blah. And it keeps a whole track of all that stuff. And it just made life so much simpler for actually controlling uh, the process where you have a lot of people with a lot of opinions. And so they found that this process could cut their, their overall development time in half just because they keep, every, they change this, change it this way, change it that way, change it this way. I always like it when, I, when my wife wants to, to move pictures on the wall at home. She goes, okay, take the thing off. Okay, now put it up over here. Oh, no, let's just put it up over there. And put, you know, and my arms are getting really tired, right? And so it's, it's, it's the same type of thing. It's, you know, they're only going to know it when they see it. So you've got to let them see it. And you've got to want them, you know, to actually on the thing, write exactly what, what they want and why. Then it makes it a lot easier for you. Now, um, I also, uh, what was that product that you were using? Uh, um, I forget your name right now. What was that product you had for the Agile process? <clears throat> product work, yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that you, you run into all the time is, especially when you get into Agile programming, is everybody's got a different opinion on what the highest priority thing is. <laughs> And you know you can only do so much at a time. And so there was this great tool that was showing me. He's using it. He says you've used it for three months on this project and a bunch of months on another project. And it sounds like well you should be able to keep track of all of these things that people want by hand in a spreadsheet. You know it's great, but someone's got to enter in the spreadsheet, and you know it's coming to you in emails. Coming to this, you're going to miss the stuff. And this product really helps do it. So there are a bunch of things out there that really make it easy, uh, or easier. Okay, um, the other thing that we will talk a lot more about is your architectural things. We've already touched on this a lot, but if you do not add the proper outs in your architecture, you're gonna be in trouble. So for example, if in on that, um, that example I was doing, well obviously I have to have a recognition engine to say is this fungus or not fungus thing. But there are going to be some things that one recognition engine will do really, really well, but it's really, really bad on something else. But if I, can, if I have another technique that does the thing that the other one's bad at, and it does that really well, but I don't care how it does. All I have to know is have two of them, and then if all of a sudden I see, hey, this one says it's this thing, and it's really good at this, I know trust it, don't trust the other one, right? Now, in order to do that, though, if, if I built it so that I take a picture and it comes into this thing and immediately spits out the result, then now I've got to go in and, and try to change that up. Because, but what I really want to have is I want to have something that can have lots of plugins, right? And I can change each of these plugins. And it goes now to here, and it figures out who's right or wrong, and it sends the result out. That's, that's a voting system. You want to think about that. Or if you're coding something, and you have a function, and it takes two inputs, if you know that this is likely to change in the future, and everything's likely to change, add a couple of extra inputs that you never use. right? Or if you're sending a message over the web, pad in extra space that's to be used in a later thing, and I don't know what it is. That way, when you change it, everything else that depends on it doesn't break. And that will save you a lot of effort. So gotchas, um, other ones. You want to figure out your other integration points. We mentioned value-added resellers. These are people that are going to use your product, and they need it to work a certain way. If you don't have an, a proper API that they can use, that means you have to go add one. That's a lot of extra rework and cost. Um, Resellers and system integrators. So they need to, that, the only thing they're going to do is take your product and they're going to go use it or they're going to use it together with another product and they're going to sell that to somebody. Well, you got to have points for how they're going to do that. You, know, right? you got to make, sometimes you have to make uh, accounting tools so that it keeps track of how much they use because if you don't have any way of keeping track of how much they use, you have to just tr trust them but you can't split it up. And if, if 
I'm in, if I'm using your tool and I'm trying to use it with 20 other comp, 20 of my customers, I want to know how much I used on customer one, how much I used on customer two, because I'm billing them differently, right? And I have different rates. If you don't have the hooks in there, you, you, you're, you're hosed. So this is the type of thing is what you want to, that's why you want to understand more of all of the stuff on the edges, even though you're not going to implement it right away, because you need to add the hooks to make it easy. Otherwise, you're going to be spending money to rewrite it. Okay, um, this is another one that I've talked to several of you about is support services. You're so interested in, in, fix, in writing your, building your first product and everything, you haven't thought a lot of times about support services. Customer support. Um, it doesn't run. Have you turned it on? No? Have you plugged it in? Oh, no, I didn't do that. Okay, go do it. Or I did this, and it, it does this, but it's not quite right. Oh, that's really important. How, you've got to have a customer service thing. And guess what? You have to train them. You need training programs for it. You need to show them examples. You got to have everything. And uh, you have to build that a lot of times so that you have then a separate system that's just used for training. It's just like the production system, but it's for training. So you can mess it up and it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't have confidential information. You have to have these types of things. If you forget it, you're in trouble. One of the other areas that I, uh, it's really funny, it's about in terms of training. So you have a training course, and it's you know a one week long training course. By the way, a lot of times these one week tra training courses, you can charge one thousand five hundred dollars per person for just one week, and you have thirty people in the room, right? And your your person that you're hiring to do it cost you a thousand dollars, so you just made a lot of money. Training is a, can be a very profitable thing, but there's a special category of training called certification, and in a lot of companies. They not only want to train their employee, but they want you to give them a little certificate that says they're an expert. In fact, they, they're at this level, and I'm getting them this level of a thing. And you know why? Because when they go out to work with their customers, they say, I have all certified people. These are certified by the thing. And we're going to charge you, you know, we're charging you 20% more because you're only using certified people. Believe it or not, you can, you know, if you've got $1,500 for the class to teach them how to do it, you might get $3,000 to give them a piece of paper. That's money. But you have to build some of those things in. Professional services. This is where they want you to go work it, do it for them. Uh, maybe they want you to do all of it. Maybe they want you to do it the first time. But they want you, because you guys know how to do it, go do it for them. And it could be for Voxel, right? We, we, you know, yeah, we have the cameras. Yeah, okay, yeah, but can you just come do it? OK, we'll go do that, right? Um, sales support, as I said, you have to have something so when your salespeople go out in the field that they can run something that convinces the people what you, you need to do, which means you have to have dummy systems so they can try stuff and just erase it really quick. Or you have to have, sometimes you need to have demo systems, which means the customer says, well, before I'm going to actually do this, I need you to leave one with us for three weeks and we're going to try it. Okay, well, that means you have to supply them with demo systems. You have to sponsor support. By the way, if they, they ask, they're going to ask you for giving them a demo system for free. You have to do that usually. But you don't have to give them training for free. And what you do is you say, training is in a different department, and they charge. They have to charge. You can send your people. You can do it. But it, you, know, you don't have to have training. You just figure it out yourself. There's a manual. Please go read it. They don't want to do that. They want to be trained. So there's a... And as I mentioned before, regulatory compliance. Different countries have very, very, very different laws. And it's not just about privacy. Privacy is a big one all over. And you can get in a lot of trouble if you, 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 you violate privacy things. But some countries like Germany, I ran into this one. Actually, it was with that soybean thing. The, the data was coming from Brazil. It was being transferred to Germany. So remember, it's Brazil thing, but it went to Germany. And then we, wanted to, we were trying to build the the training thing, we build it in California. And so we said, let's just move it. Nope, you're not allowed to move the data. That's German data. Well, it came from Brazil. It's German data now. So we actually had to get a server over in Germany, load all of our stuff on it, and do the stuff in Germany. We were allowed to process it in Germany. We were not allowed to process it in the United States. OK, these are laws that are, that are out there. There are all kinds of compliance laws. And if you do something with 
the, with a drug company or an energy company or airlines or stuff like that. There are all kinds of extra special rules. So you have to know about those and factor those into all of your technical planning. Okay. Clearly, as you were doing your, your, your product roadmap that's coming down in here and you're going to move it forward and your solution architecture, the ideal thing is your architecture can not only, not only help you do this, but maybe help you do the next several products. Certainly minor changes, it should always be covered under your architecture. Okay, uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about development methodologies as part of it. And so, yes? I'm sorry, Sunday. Sunday, right? Sunday, yeah. So we're going to talk about it. And, you know, there are various different methodologies you can use. Uh, it, this gets to be a very philosophical and religious thing for some people about what methodology they use. Uh, any of them can be made to work. Some will be work better in certain situations than others. In particular, if you have, if your customer problem is extremely well known, it's been done for a long time, then you can use a simple solution like a water foam. You know, to make, there's a fancy coffee machine in the other room. To make a cup of coffee is real simple and well defined. You can just write it out. Just select this, hit this button, right? Water foam model works real well for that. Now, if you have to have something that's mostly known, so like um, we're going to make this type of soup and the recipe's there, but you can take, change up this, change up that, you know, I like a little spicy, I like more potatoes, whatever, then you know, you can, you, you can use a different methodology. If it's like, we're just gonna make food and I don't know what type it's gonna be, ooh, that's, that's, that's an experimental thing because what I think I might want, my family doesn't want, they want something else. So you, you have a more iterative process. The other, the other dimension is, is it really all of the steps actually known? How to do this has been done before? Or it, you know, does this need something really new? Something really novel, right? And some of you are gonna face things like that. You need some really novel stuff. And this guy we were talking about things today is like, well, when I'm flying this drone around inside of this big container, you know, this big container, I don't know exactly where it is. I think I know where it is, I've got this, but you know, they wanna know it exactly. And so now I've got to think about it. Oh, I've got to come up with some different approaches to that. That's, that's when you get into the unknown space, right? Some of the stuff is really well known. Other things are not. So we'll talk about these things. What are the types of ways you need to, to approach this?